Thank you so much, Lynn. It's truly an honor to be here, and I really appreciate you guys coming over lunch. Sports injuries are at an all-time high. I mean, we know that that is probably the, one of the biggest topics of com conversation. It is just seems that constantly someone has a season-ending injury, whether it's at the professional level or at the high school level. It, it is just pervasive in our society. And what we know is if this is your daughter, she might be four times more likely to get injured than her teammate who's standing right by her who might look exactly the same, yet she's at normal risk. So what we've done is we've taken a scientific approach to see what we can know about predicting these injuries. So if we look at the science, what we know is hands down by far previous injury is the number one risk factor for future injury. And that sounds crazy simple. You know, you've been injured, so you're more likely to get injured again. That seems obvious. Why do we need research? Well, there's tons and tons of studies that show this. Over 25 studies show that previous injury, once you're injured, you're, you, you're from two to 18 times more likely to get injured. The best study of this was in professional soccer in Europe. They did an eight-year study, and actually it's now in its 10th year. And looking at thousands of players, they actually had 9,000 injuries. So if you look at how many players and seasons that is, that's a lot. And hands down, by far, they measured a lot of different things, but the number one risk factor is future injury. Interestingly enough, this is, this is one of the world's renowned epidemiologists in sports injuries. And his conclusion is there's nothing we can do about it. And from a scientific perspective, he's probably right. You know, once someone's injured, you can't unring that bell. It's already occurred. But we kind of went into it a little bit deeper and said, you know, we're just not comfortable with saying there's nothing you can do about it. What can we do? So if we were to look at this player who sprains her ankle, who just simply, you know, rolls her ankle, goes through physical therapy, gets to the end of physical therapy, and we test range of motion and strength and hopping, and all these boxes get checked off that everything's normal. But guess what? When she goes back out on the field, she's four times more likely to get injured. If we had her counterpart sprain her ankle, goes through the exact same rehab with the exact same physical therapist, she might be at normal risk. Why is that? So unfortunately, there's still nothing we can do about it. So if we look a little bit deeper into the research, what factors occur after an injury that we can possibly change? So we know we can't remove that injury, and we know we might not be able to get the ligaments and everything exactly back to where they were, but we want to be certain that we are not leaving anything on the table that could be changed, that is causing her to be at increased risk. There's numerous studies just simply after an ankle sprain that there's altered activation patterns in the quadriceps, in the hamstrings, in the gastrox. There's decreased hip and knee control. They don't have that coordination throughout the entire limb. Even their glutes, which is a far away from the ankle, don't contract as quickly and as strongly compared to healthy controls and compared to their other side. These research studies come out of uh, labs like the Dunnegan Movement Analysis Lab, which we're very thankful for uh, the Dunnegan family's gift, that we can know these things in the lab. The problem is when in our county area, we're doing thousands of pre-participation physicals, seeing hundreds of patients, they all can't go through an hour and a half, two hours, three hours of testing to be able to know what their risk is. So she goes back to sport, and she's still four times more likely to get injured, even though we know some of these factors still occur. Yes? Same injury or a different injury or the same injury. So it, it occurs both. Once you sprain your ankle, you're actually more likely to tear your ACL. So what seems something simple can lead to a complex problem and, and a season ending and sometimes career ending injury. So there's still nothing we can do about it. There's no way to deploy those hours of testing out to the masses. But what if 
we could take simple clinical tests like the functional movement screen and the Y balance test and those have been shown to be predictive of injury in multiple populations. If we can take those tests and go and put them into an algorithm that to, looks at all the different factors and all the different outcomes and bases it on that one individual, then there may be something we can do about injury. So could you imagine sitting down with an athlete at either at the end of the rehab, the parents are sitting there, the athlete's sitting there, and we can say, are you ready to go back to sport? No, you're not, and here is the exact reason why you're not. That would be powerful. Or at the beginning of the season, before we even start, to say, hey, you know, you need to do some things before the season begins so we can determine whether you're at risk for injury. Now, Dr. Kiesel is going to go through the process of, of how we got here and how we came to this conclusion and then what we actually can do about it. Yes? How do you, uh, so if someone gets injured, they're four times likely to be injured again. The person next to them who was injured as well is injured. Yeah. Now, how do you know that? Just because they didn't get hurt again? Right. Yeah, so they didn't get it hurt again. Now, did they have risk factors that might be there and it's just a matter of time before they get injured? And the interesting thing is now, this is where we're going, is we now know that based on some studies that Dr. Kiesel is going to go through, that that person is more risk than the other person. So yeah, there's, there's, there's some research we can go through to help, help clarify that for you. It's a great question. Other questions? Okay. Thanks, Phil. So we'll back up a little bit and get a sense of sort of how we got here and how we put these things together. Uh, in my clinical work prior to the year 2000, uh, really the late 90s, I was fortunate enough to work in a physical therapy clinic with a, a physical therapist that was um, developing some ideas that were profound essentially. Uh, and I was uh, part of the development of one of the tools that we're talking about, the functional movement screen. And quite frankly, that inspired me to do more uh, including get into academics uh, and I was able to start in academics here at UE uh, as Lynn said back in 2000. Um, then uh, I was working on my doctoral work teaching at UE doing clinical work and Dr. Plisky came back uh, to UE to finish or to uh, Evansville excuse me to finish his doctoral work and I knew the testing that we were doing and then I met Phil he was describing the testing that he was doing we had this sort of common goal of injury prevention and prediction, and, and that really drove what we did. And I looked at Phil's test, and he was doing this balance test, and it was interesting how it's evolved over the years uh, to what it is today. But I said, you know, it's, it's body relative movement testing. It's how you control yourself um, in space. And the test that we did, seven different movements of the movement screen, had even more components to it to help us decide what was wrong, where those big categories of movement deficits are. So we got together and we were able to evolve into what it is today. We would uh, always take an, we will always take an opportunity to uh, thank those that have helped us along the way, and in particularly at UE, uh, Dr. Frank Underwood, who was a uh, substantial mentor to both uh, Phil and I as we worked through our dissertations. <coughs> Uh, and he has continued to help us um, grow uh, individually. He's still helping us today on, on several of the papers that we'll talk about uh, in a minute. Uh, and we would like to thank him and uh, have everyone, I guess, understand that he was uh, such a part of what we've done and the research now that we're able to do uh, through the department. So since we combined things together and have been working together, uh, even as, as late as 06, we have been able to do uh, quite a bit of work and get several of our manuscripts published. And as Lynn mentioned, uh, we are proud that we have an international uh, impact and we are continuing to grow with that as we uh, collaborate with other researchers. Um, because of connections um, previously and as all this came together, we have had opportunities to work with a number of different professional sports organizations and that has helped uh, with credibility, has helped us learn, and it has given us an opportunity to interact with the highest uh, level of athlete in the world, the professional athlete, which we have uh, learned a lot from. Um, again, I want to thank Larry Dunnigan for his generous gift, which got the lab started from a bricks and mortar and equipment perspective. 
Um, but what we also learned was we, we have this lab equipment, but the lab can extend well beyond one particular study or one particular detailed uh, motion analysis component. And we started looking at that and realizing that we got to get this information out, but it's all part of the lab. We're all, all one. We're doing it uh, together for the same purpose. So that led us to start looking at how we could employ some of our tests out in the field and bring them together. And probably the most um, important day for this whole concept was uh, when Phil and I were helping with pre-participation physicals in the area. We were actually out at Tecumseh High School. And we were kind of arguing over which tests we should do, and we always had athletic trainers and physical therapists in the field that were helping us say, not enough time to do that, not enough time to do this, it has to be quick, it has to be fast. So we had all this good feedback. So we kind of condensed it down, and we were, we were together working, and um, athletes would uh, go through our system of screening that we developed, and they handed us a piece of paper with the results, and Phil and I sit there and we look at the results of these two tests and previous injury and some other things. And when we said, wow, this, this person looks great. They can go on and keep doing what they're doing. We said, wow, this person probably needs to go see Dr. Saltzman or one of our physicians right away today. This isn't good. They have pain. They have lots of problems. The next person, they'll probably do okay. They'll, they'll do fine with maybe a few specific exercises. The next person probably needs to go see a physical therapist, maybe one of our sports residents right here. And so we looked at each other and said, you know, we can, we can make this work for more than just us here. We can turn this into something bigger because the decision tree is a systematic thing following the evidence. Because there's no way that we can get 10 people and two doctorally trained people at every high school, not even in Evansville. So we thought this algorithm idea is where we're going to go next. And so we evolved with that. Again, taking it to professional teams has helped us a lot. If anything, credibility, but we've learned a lot working with those folks taken it to the college level, certainly have uh, utilized uh, uh, the athletes at the University of Evansville to help us, as well as other uh, schools. And then now down to the high schools, which at the end of the day, our mission has always been high school athletics. I mean, that's really where it starts. And I remember back in uh, Danville, Virginia, a small town in Southern Virginia where I worked uh, with Greg Cook. He said, you know, let's just go out to high school, see if we can help them out a little bit. That's all we really wanted to do is prevent a few injuries and, and help them, and that's how really a lot of this got started. So we're proud uh, that we've developed methods that allow us to go into the field, collect these data in a, in a meaningful, efficient way, and now we're able to do over a thousand physicals just in, in, this, uh, in this region every year. And so it has helped us learn how to do them, learn what they mean, and recognize the resources that it does take. Because of collaboration, which um, as we move forward in science, collaboration has been something that has helped more than probably anything else. You know, technology is great to talk about, but learning how to collaborate is crucial. In my doctoral training, in, we had a course, and one of the main themes of the seminar course was how to collaborate. It used to be you'd have your data in the lab, and you'd be in the lab, and you looked over your shoulder, hope nobody would find out what you're doing. Now you share everything. And so having that training, and Phil having that uh, experience as well got us out. We met a lot of really nice people and people that would always share and we could tell right away. People that want to talk about what they're doing, know what you're doing and want to collaborate. Those are the ones that we gravitated to. Others that were trying to develop their own thing, we naturally stayed away, away from. So through this collaboration in, in many areas, and this was actually started in the spinal research that I was doing, but they said, you're testing a thousand athletes in, in a year. How many can you do in an hour? I said, we got down pretty good. We can do probably a couple hundred in about two and a half hours. But, wow, can we come see what you're doing? And these were military researchers, and we all understand institutional budgets. They're like, if we can spend this money by tomorrow, we can come up and see what you're doing. So be happy to, to have you here. So a couple of the researchers from Army Baylor's program came to spend time that we knew and spend time with us and uh, get a sense of what we were doing. They were here. They, they saw the value in what we did. At that time, um, the lead researcher recognized there's a, some grant money out there for this, and we literally that day started a process of getting a grant together uh, to get some money to take a closer look. That um, eventually evolved into two separate grants that we were awarded as a group. Again, there's seven sort of primary investigators, if you will, uh, involved in this, and multiple institutions, including Baylor University, Army's program, and Duke University in this uh, uh, and what we call the uh, MP3 study. So we were working with elite athletes all the way down to high school athletes, 
musculoskeletal injuries in the military are, are devastating. And there's been many, many different efforts and still other efforts going on to reduce those. And we were going to want to apply our technology, our thought process, and our methodology in the military. And we're about a year and a half into it. Uh, we've collected uh, data on uh, almost 1,500 soldiers, and we're now following those soldiers for injury, and we will create new algorithms um, based on the, the results of this study. So we're very excited about that. Um, I will say, unfortunately, the uh, $1.48 million didn't all come to UE, uh, but some of it did. Uh, so we are, we are excited about that. Uh, another study that has truly helped us to validate the concepts, it's, uh, these are nice ideas, they're basing the evidence, but we have to go out and test them. Uh, it was done uh, at a college, small college, with actually a student of mine uh, back from the late 90s. This uh, uh, gentleman came and he wanted to learn what we were doing, so as a physical therapy student, he came and uh, was one of my students. And uh, 10 years later, I saw him at, at, a, at a meeting and he said, hey, Remember me? I'm still doing all the stuff you guys taught me. It's working well. And I'm like, that's great. So he continues to collaborate with. And he, uh, with our guidance, uh, did this uh, study which took all of our um, uh, concepts together uh, at the collegiate level. And again, what we emphasize is the, the side of it that it's, it's not one thing. It's not one test. It's how you put those together, recognizing the evidence and the scientific approach behind these algorithms. And what people were doing was was trying to figure out that there was one thing. You know, if you understood proprioception and, and strength, then that's the variable that you found and you thought that was gonna be it and that's what we're gonna change. Or if you understood joint mechanics and what the joint was doing from a biomatic, biomechanical perspective, that's what you looked at. And what we realized is all these factors together make a difference and there's no way we can go treat each individual factor. So essentially what we did with our science is create these categories. And, and literally from sitting down and being in the field at, at, at high schools and colleges, we recognize some people need physician today. Some people need a well-trained sports medicine therapist. Some people are doing just great. Leave them alone, hands off, okay? And this helped us uh, not only probably manage the athletes better, but maybe even as importantly, manage resources. So this study, uh, we were able to uh, look at 183 different athletes and uh, the way the categor categories came out, we only had 27 that hit our normal categories. We're like, oh gosh, it's not too many. We were a little worried. Slight about 93, moderate 37, substantial 26. We followed them out for a year and see who got hurt and here's the number of injuries. Um, you know, not to get too far into the research, but the injury definition is a really important piece and we're able to work together with several people to come up with that correctly. So essentially those in the bottom two categories were much more likely to be injured. And from a statistical standpoint, when we collapse the two categories and consider that high risk, we have a very strong study, meaning if you're in one of those two categories, you're 3.4 times more likely to be injured. And um, again, not to bore you with the statistics, but the confidence interval is the key. So this means I'm 95% sure that you're at least two times more likely, but it could be as much as six, okay? So that's the key. We evolved from that, again, through the military study, the military grant, and, and putting our heads together in terms of what to do, and we said the key is individualization, this individual category, and so we developed reports that gave us information about the category that each athlete was in, as well as their individual scores. Because at some point we have to use one of the scores to figure out what's our, our strategy in terms of preventing these injuries. And we were able to put that together. And again, following the evidence, we recognize the importance of individualized reports, individualized information, and ultimately individualized uh, strategies. So we created this these cut points, and it's powerful when you recognize that athletes want to know where they stand against other people. Coaches and athletes don't really care about injury prediction, okay? They don't care much about prevention because they're never going to get hurt, and if they do, they'll be okay. Tape it up, little ice, and they'll be back in the game. So we realize, you know, we've got to make it personal. We've got to make it uh, almost competitive, if you will. So how do they score? They're interested in that, and they want to know where they fall. And so that helped us a lot with compliance and helped us move forward with the intervention strategy. So now if your, one of your uh, sons or daughters gets a physical uh, EVSC system, they'll be handed three individual exercises to get started on that day. So we can print them out right on the spot based on the algorithm, based on how they move individually. And so we are uh, excited that that has all come together and it's taken 
uh, quite a bit of work as you can imagine to make that happen if they're ready for that. They may need, the, the, the computer may spit out, you need a referral to a physician or you need to see a physical therapist. I don't trust these exercises for the parameters. You failed so badly, we need to look at you individually. So we know um, that sometimes that happens, that happens a lot, okay? So we are comfortable now that there is something we can do about previous injury as a, a risk factor because these neuromuscular um, deficits exist and now we have a way to streamline it and make it efficient um, at, the, at the user end. So again, normal risk, four times more likely. Let's work together to see if we can decrease that, get them all the way down to normal, okay? How do you know? When you have a group of kids out there, it has to be evidence-based and we have to consider these individual tests, okay? So we wanna emphasize the individual piece and the, the evidence-based piece that puts you in that category and allow, allows for individualized programs. 